Shalom and welcome to Crackpot. So I have been having some internet issues, so apologies if there's any lagging in this recording. I've also got a little visitor outside my window who's very talkative. So this is part two in our series on snakes and seraphs. And if you missed part one, then I encourage you to go listen to it. It's only about 16 minutes and it'll help set a foundation for what we're studying so you're not lost in what we're doing in this part, part two. So in part one, we learned uh, where the very first time the Hebrew word or snake or serpent actually shows up. And we also looked into the three main Hebraic words that are often translated as snake or serpent. So for this study, we're going to be closely examining our enemy as well as some really interesting passages in Genesis. Most of us are familiar with the story of how the serpent tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden. And that story is found in Genesis. And there are numerous artist renditions of this. There's one up on your screen for you to see right now. And it usually has Eve, and then you have a piece of fruit, which is usually an apple. And then you always have a snake in a tree. So this study is going to aim at rethinking that image, which, by the way, is false in hint. <laughs> so in Hebrew, words often carry a literal or a physical meaning right alongside a figurative or a spiritual meaning. So what do I mean by that? Is that for example, there are obviously physical snakes but there are supernatural or spiritual snakes as well. So here is an example. This is Revelation 12, verse 9. It says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan who deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the Bible makes it really clear that these are the names or titles of the enemy. So the enemy is a dragon, which is the Hebraic word Tanin, which we learned about in part one, that can be translated as serpent, sea creature, sea monster, and also dragon. He is called a dragon 19 times in the book of Revelation. So that's probably the book that calls him the dragon the most and he is referred to as a red dragon at times. He is a Nahash, a snake, a Serah, a fiery serpent, and a Tanin, a dragon, and all three of those are closely related to one another. The name devil actually only shows up in the New Testament, and that word means accuser, whereas Satan is actually a Hebraic word, and it means adversary. So these are just titles and names and descriptions of the enemy of our soul. So there is some confusion and debate as to whether Satan is a cherub, and it's heavily promoted that he is a cherub, um, and I say that he is not. And I'm going to explain why I think that. One of the main reasons is 
the Caribs are never referred to as serpents or snakes or dragons, ever. And that is one of Satan's main descriptions or characteristics is as a serpent, the old serpent, the dragon. We just read that in Revelation. So cherubim have no serpentine qualities at all. Seraph or seraphim do. Their very name means fiery serpent. So I believe that Satan did not change from a cherub into a serpent when he fell. He is a nachash, a tanin, and a seraph. He's a seraph. <laughs> He's a fiery serpent. It's what he's always been. And I think someone came along and just told us that Ezekiel 28, 14 uh, was alluding to Satan. And we all just believed it because somebody said that that's what that meant. I think also that to fix the error, we could say perhaps somebody translated it wrong or not translated it, but from manuscript to manuscript that maybe the original word was serif and it became carob and that's why um, that happened and it was certainly fixed a lot of issues with that verse, but more than likely because the Hebraic scriptures have been intact for thousands of years. It's more likely that that passage is referring to another being that opposed God. After all, we just looked at Revelation 12, 9, and it said that there were a bunch of angels that fell with Satan. He's certainly not the only one that's going to be in opposition to God. At any rate, I just do not believe that Satan is a carrot because they just do not have any serpentine qualities and they're never referred to as dragons or serpents. All right, well, now we're going to look at passages in Genesis with fresh eyes. So it's really time to get this Sunday school image of a talking possessed snake in a tree out of our heads and we need to think spiritually and about attributes and character instead of just merely a physical snake the serpent is a title or a name just like we just read in revelation it's also found all throughout the bible the serpent <laughs> It's a title, it's a name, and name in Hebrew, well, it always points to the personality or the character traits behind the name bearer. Names just don't randomly appear or get given to people or, in this case, the serpent. To be clear, every title or name given to our foe, Satan, Devil, Dragon, Serpent, and others, are all nouns, but they're not proper nouns, meaning it's not a name in the sense of, for example, Michael or Gabriel. The nouns and attributes tell us who he is, but a direct noun or name for a nemesis is never given. If you come across what seems like a name, look it up and you will find that it's just a general noun, like mountain, but not specific or a proper noun like Mount Everest. In the Bible, it never gives us an actual name for our arch enemy. Let's review what we learned last week with Nakash. Okay, Nakash is 5175. 
And remember that sound like Bach, the composer, CH. So going from right to left, you have your noon, your head, and your shin. It translates to serpent or snake, but what I want us to focus on is that divination part. So it's really interesting that in ancient times, snakes were used for divination. It's very popular in Egypt, which is why the miraculous sign of Aaron casting down his rod and it turning into a serpent was very important. There was hissing, whispering, and chanting. It's all conveyed in this root word of Nechash. So the adversary deceives through this trickery and occultic deception. Apostle Paul talks about this when he wrote to the church at Corinth. Let's look at that verse. Second Corinthians 11, 3. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your mind may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So that's how the enemy gets us. <laughs> it's through our mind. I want us to look at one more Hebrew word that will help us understand the temptation scheme with a little more clarity. And that is the Hebrew word, chai. So once again, that sound. And the A-Y, think I-I meeting. So that word is chai, not K. And the strong number is 2416. Read from right to left. The arrow show you what direction. You have the letter chet and a yod. And this is translated life and living alive. The root is to live. And this word shows up 503 times in the Hebrew scriptures. That's a lot. And the translators are going to look at that word high and make a decision on what word they want to use based on the context of the sentence structure and how they think it should fit. Let's look at an example of this in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's 2416. That's that word chai. And the man became a living 2416 chai being. So now we're ready to go look at the serpent in the garden. Here we are in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So here we have that root word, nechash. Remember the character of what a nechash is. And notice that it says the most cunning or crafty of all beings or life form because you have that word high there. They could have easily put living creature. Um, they could have put a lot of words there, but they chose beast because they're connecting it to the field. But the field basically means in Hebrew, a cultivated section of land. So remember, even an angel would be high because it is alive. So the enemy was there as himself. He was there as a seraph. He did not possess a physical snake, hang out in a tree, 
and speak through a physical snake causing an entire species of animals to get cursed. It is the attribute of the root of Nakash. He was whispering, enchanting, he was working his magic to deceive Eve. And it all starts with being friendly and social. <laughs> and the serpent comes along friendly and social and he has the pretense of being ignorant about God's command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then he twists the truth into a form of a question. So that twisting the truth in a form of a question is really a brilliant maneuver. So this understanding of Satan being present physically as himself in the garden is going to be a hard mental shift because now we're left to ponder what's the real meaning behind the curses that were leveled at him for deceiving Eve. It's not about the snake species being regulated to eat dirt. We all know that snakes do not consume, consume dirt as food. So let's look at that verse. This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than any animal of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Notice the strong numbers there. I put those there to emphasize that this is talking about a living being and the life form rather than a physical animal. And he is the first to be cursed. And there are many Hebrew words for curse. This one is arar. And it's connected to a rut, which means to bind to or to restrict freedom. Curses are serious stuff. And the serpent is going to endure this curse as long as it has life. So it's regulated to its belly, which is a very low and serious emotion in status and power. And then we get to the part where it talks about the consumption of dirt or dust. So what is man made of? To what will we return? So the death of humans becomes food or the energy source for the enemy of our souls. The serpent wanted the power over humans and the earth. And now he is bound to death. The serpent enjoyed beauty and status and freedom. And he is now confined, confined to a very low status. He's consuming death. And he is now bound to it and all of its ugliness. I'm sure there's a lot more packed in this verse and even deeper layers to this curse than discussed in this video. So let's shift gears a little bit before we end. It's intriguing to note that all nachashim or snakes in the Bible are poisonous. Every single one that's mentioned is poisonous. And this has to do a lot with the region in which these snakes are going to be mentioned in the Middle East, but it also has to do with the context of what the, the scriptures are trying to point towards our enemy and judgment. So we're going to briefly look at some names for some species of snakes in the scriptures. So in English, we'd read adder or cobra, 
viper, asp, and that's what we find in our Bibles. But in Hebrew, the words all have this interesting air sound. You're going to hear the puff noise of air and hissing, like Like, for example, seraph. You hear that hissing, puffing sound? So here are some names for the poisonous snakes. And the translators actually use these quite interchangeably. So in one translation, you might see the word viper. And then in another translation for the same exact word, it'll say ass. Well, you'll have another translator for the same exact word, say cobra. So it's quite, you know, interchangeable, uh, depending on what the translator wanted to put in there. Uh, but you can see that the Hebrew words and the Strong's references, if you want to go and study deeper into each Nakash on your own, so what is interesting to me is all of those Hebraic hissing, puffing air sounds. So the first one would be F-F, and then we have Shishifon, you hear that sh And then you have Sefa, <laughs> that sh and then Petan. So to me, it's really interesting that the Hebraic words all have that hissing, puffing. <laughs> uh. So I hope you enjoyed this video and found it interesting going a little bit deeper into the scriptures. Next is going to be part three. In the next video, we're going to get into uh, the seraph and Moses and that serpent on the pole and how Yeshua came to destroy the devil's work. So hit that subscribe button if you don't want to miss out on any of our upcoming studies and stuff that we're going to be doing on our Crackpot channel. So I'll see you next time and may Heavenly Father smile upon you and bless you with his peace.